Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to see you here. Good to hear the fellowship and the visiting. Uh, and so we're just excited that you've chosen to worship with us today at First Baptist Church, Bogota. As I said, we're excited to see you here. We start out, as we always do on the first Sunday of the month, by celebrating those who have birthdays and anniversaries this month. If you have a birthday in the month of May, please stand. If you have a birthday in the month of May. All right. We have several birthday folks. All right. Let's sing. If you were married in the month of May, May bride and grooms, if y'all were married in the month of May, all right, look, look, looking good there. <laughs> where, where is he, Crystal? Don't know. All right. Well, let's sing. Thank you, thank you. Well, Tim, I'm glad you made it back. Crystal was having to stand all by herself. All right, DF2 continues today after the song service. So all kiddos will dismiss and go to DF2 as soon as the song service is over. Remember, a reminder, I guess, that our Wednesday night activities continue this Wednesday. Uh, we have a light meal served beginning at 5 o'clock, but as I always remind you, you can come at 5 or 5.15 or 5.30 or 5.40, whenever you can get here. We have a light meal beginning at 5, and then our Bible studies begin at 6. And I know you may get tired of us saying this, but we have something for everyone on Wednesday night. The kids, Disciple Factory, we have the youth activities, and then we have a Bible study for both ladies and men. Some great Bible studies have gone on this year, so we invite you to come Wednesday night. The Bible study begins at 6. Our volunteers for serving this week are Melissa and Dee Dee, so we look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday night. Today, special event going on. The youth are having a cake and dessert auction after church today. There's some great desserts down there, a lot of desserts from what I understand. So that means we need lots of bidders. Now, there's no meal. You know, we used to have a meal and then the auction, but just straight for the auction today. So if you like to stay, we hope you will. The proceeds from this dessert auction go toward the youth summer camp, help them to pay for the summer camp. So if you can stay, and we hope you can, after service, go down and sign in, and you'll be given a bidder's card, a bidder's number. We're going to try to help out a little bit in the, in the process. So if you're going to stay and bid, go down after church, after service, and you'll be given a bidder's number. There will be a basket in the foyer, however, if you can't stay for the auction but want to support the uh, youth fund, you can make a donation there on the, on the Welcome Center. There's a basket for the youth fund. But we hope that you can stay and be a part of the dessert auction. Parents, we're going to have a special baby dedication service on Mother's Day, May 8th. That's next Sunday. Ne special baby dedication your child does not have to be an infant to participate. But if you want to be involved in this, please see Brother Jeff uh, this morning. Uh, let him know your desire. The cutoff 
for our participation is today. So if you would like to be a part of that, let Brother Jeff know today. Also, next Sunday on Mother's Day, we're going to have a special backdrop set up for moms to have a picture made. Mom by themselves or mom with family or mom with grandkids or whatever. But that will be set up next Wednesday. The picture will be taken by Heather Williams. Each family will receive an 8 by 10. It will be offered to all of us, all of you. So be prepared for that next Sunday. Also, summer's coming up soon, and that means Vacation Bible School. We have already started pre-registering kids for Vacation Bible School. There's a QR code on the poster in the foyer. If you don't know what that is, see Johnny. He'll be happy to explain that to you. <laughs> we, pick, we pick on Johnny way too much, don't we? He's got a thick, he's got a thick hide. Uh, that's, yeah, all right. Anyway, there's the QR code on the poster in the foyer. Scan that. Follow the directions to register your kids for our VBS. It's June the 12th through the 16th. If you have any questions about that, Please see Crystal Mills or Michelle Sanjul. But be thinking and praying about Vacation Bible School. A lot of folks in our church and in our community are in need of prayers, but we want to particularly remember Frances Lee. As you know, not too long ago, she fell and broke her arm, had to have some surgery. Well, yesterday she rebroke her arm. So uh, Ms. Frances is in need of our prayer, so please remember her. Anything else? If not, let's stand for our word of prayer, and then we'll get the worship service underway. Father God, Lord, we do come to you today uh, just, again, in awe of your power, your majesty, your love, and your grace. Your comfort is so evident Lord, we just thank you for every family that's here today, every family that's represented here today. Lord, we are, we are thankful that you have brought each one here. We know that no one's here by accident. It's all part of your plan. So, Lord, I pray that everything done today in this service, in song and in word, glorifies your name, nothing else. Lord, I just pray for those that are hurting. I pray for Miss Francis particularly. I pray for families that have lost loved ones and, and are hurting. I pray for those that are undergoing medical treatments, having tests done, having procedures done. Lord, we just lift every situation up to you. Pray for your will to be done first and foremost. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. And this we say in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I think y'all knew better than that. Good morning. All right. Join with us this morning.
and greet someone this morning that you've not had a chance to speak to and welcome each other. Join us as we sing his praise. about it this morning.
young David went to battle with only five smooth stones. Whole armies were afraid to face this giant. But David had faith in God. He did not fear. We all face giants in our lives. A difficult diagnosis. A struggling marriage. A loss of a loved one. A lost job. Take courage. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? If you have your Bibles, would you stand to your feet? This is a verse of promise that we find in Scripture. Let's claim it together today. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You may be seated. So let me tell you a little bit about my week. On Monday, somewhere around 9 o'clock, our director of missions calls me. Mr. Gil Siegler. I'm driving, so I can't answer the phone. We get stopped. He and I call him back and say, hey, Gil. He says, hey, Pastor Jeff, I'm just calling to check on you. I said, well, you caught me. I'm headed out of town on the first thing smoking this morning with nine women that I'm not married to. (laughs) Next phone call I received was my father-in-law. He calls me and says, hey, I know what you're doing, so I'm checking on you. I said, man, we have already been run out of two counties, and we're not even to... Missouri yet. He said, I know, that's why I called you. You're on the news. <laughs> Just kidding. We had a great week in Branson, Missouri. Now, Branson is a beautiful place, but let me just say, if you try to go straight from Bogota, Texas to Branson, make sure you have enough time. It's not as flat as we are around Bogota. Uh, Just so you know, I took a picture of one of the roads. Ben, would you show the group of convicts? I mean, uh, (laughs) I'm kidding with them. Some of the sweetest ladies you'll ever meet in your life. We had a great time, a great uh, great week together. We made it there and made it back. But there's not a straight shot from here to there. And when you get to Branson, I'm just guessing now. I didn't actually figure this up. Just guessing. In Branson, once you get there, to go a mile, it actually takes 10 miles because you're doing this all the way there. I took a picture of one of the roads. Ben, do you have it for me? There you go. (laughs) Not that bad, but that's what it felt like. Ladies, can I get an amen? But we made it, and we had a great week, so I'm thankful for the opportunity that we had. Um, We had a precious couple. The Burroughs met us there and helped us out getting our ladies in. I I spoiled them. So if you're married to one of them and they expect to be dropped off at the front of the church and picked up from now on, that's Pastor Jeff's doing. I tried to spoil our ladies, but some of our ladies that went are widows and a precious jewel to our church. And it it was a great week, and they behaved. Did I say that? They behaved. So let's get back into the word this morning, this first day of May. And it's a beautiful day outside. It's a more beautiful day, I believe, in the house of God because he is here as well as his people. We're talking about the story of David and Goliath. If you saw the title, I hope you know that it's from the reference when David takes his shepherd's bag and he chooses him five smooth stones. The first Sunday, this past Sunday, if you weren't here, we talked about Goliath. And he was the adversary, so we looked at how, what made him the adversary and how that applies today to us as we face our adversary. You see, the Bible refers to our adversary as the devil, and he is one that is like, he's referred to as a lion roaming, seeking whom he may devour. And we talked about our adversary. Well, today in part two, it's titled, God Gets the Glory. I'm standing before you as a recipient of God's grace, and I am so excited to report to you that God in heaven, mighty God in heaven that spoke the universe into existence, he often looks for the weak or the young or those that may be refuse or or thrown away by the world. God often looks to those individuals and says, that's the one I'm going to use for my glory. Now that gets me excited because I wouldn't be here as pastor of First Baptist Church but go to Texas if God only called the elite, the top notch, the first in class. 
God often uses the least. So today we're not focusing on the adversary, but we're going to be focusing on that young man that took to the battlefield whose name is David. Now if you've grown up in church, this isn't the standalone story of David. It's probably the one that, that we know the most because of what takes place. Help me out this morning, church. When you think about King David, he's not king yet in our story, but when you think about David, how Scripture refers to him, or how what, what stands out to you about David? Somebody. Not all at once. Brave. Absolutely brave. Ruddy. What else stands out to you? What does is, what is Scripture refer to him as and nobody else in all of Scripture? A man after God's own heart. So, ruddy means he had freckles and red hair. No. No, it doesn't mean that. He was brave. Scripture refers to him as ruddy in complexion. He's referred to in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. But let's start here with this reminder. David was just a man. He wasn't a superhero. He, he, he wasn't able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. He was not a superman. He was a boy. He, in our story today, he was a boy. He had, listen to this youth, he had chores. Can I get a witness? He had hobbies. He had things that he liked. He had things that he did. He had brothers. He had a, he had a regular life. And he was a regular man except he had a call of God on his life. Man, there are so many names that we can attach to ours. There are so many accolades we can seek in this life. But let me say to you today, under the blood of Jesus Christ, if you are His child, the greatest thing to know is that God has called all of us to bring Him glory. Every one of us, from the pastor to the back row, if you're a child of God, there's a calling on your life to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. The most special attribute about David, though we think about his bravery, we think about the way he took that stand, we think about him being referred to as a man after God's own heart. The greatest thing about him was his God. His God. He wasn't abnormal. He wasn't superhuman. He was called by God. We're going to be back in Scripture today. We started with the first 11 verses. I want you to turn with me back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to carry on into the story this morning. And see what we can glean about this young man named David. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 12. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in the, in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shemiah, all, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts. And Jesse had, as Jesse had directed him, he arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for battle with shouts and a battle cry. Soon the Israelites and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. Verse 22, David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army heard him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. 
he will give, what that, give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. David asked the soldier standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, Yes, this is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence in the sanctuary. We thank you for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ in worship of you. Fathers, we've spent this time in your word. As we spend this time together in your word, we ask God that you'll give an increase to those that know you as Lord and Savior. And Father, that you'll speak to the heart of anyone who's here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, as we pray today, we lift up many families. There are loved ones in the hospitals, loved ones awaiting procedures, families in our community that have lost loved ones in recent days. We lift those to you. Father, as I stand before the congregation, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name, God's people said, Amen. Amen. So this passage, it shows us what David was like and what he spent his time doing. We already know that um, he's the one that's going to take the stand against Goliath, if you know the story. But who really was this young man that was going to be willing to fight? We're going to look at some things about David this morning. The first being this, David was young. We learn in verse 14, Scripture says that David was the youngest son. Maybe you remember the story about David. Maybe you remember uh, a chapter earlier, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse to, a, to anoint the next king of Israel. He goes to Jesse's house. He knows that the next king comes from the sons of Jesse, but he does not know which one. So Jesse in the story, in, in one chapter earlier, chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, Jesse brings out all of his sons except for one. When Samuel uh, has all these, these young men come before him, they, they get down to the very last one and there's, there's still not a nod from the Holy Spirit from God to Samuel that the next king is before him. So Samuel poses the question. He asks, is there, is there another? And the father's response, Jesse's response, is there's still another, he's the youngest, and he's out tending the sheep. Well, if I could give you the modern day version of what he said, it's almost like he's saying, oh, there's, there's one more, but it's just David, the youngest. He's so young that he's just out tending the sheep. Well, if you know the story, Samuel says for Jesse to call for his son, and when Jesse stands before Samuel, Samuel knows this is the next king of Israel, and David is anointed. You see in our story, in the story in chapter 16, David is dismissed or overlooked simply because he was the youngest. Simply because he was the youngest. All the other brothers, now when, when the eldest brother steps out, I'm sure Samuel's thinking, wow, this is the tallest, strongest, most wise. But as, as one after another and another and another step before him, they weren't the one. But all the other brothers probably were taller than David. They were probably wiser in the ways of the world because they had lived longer than David. All the king, uh, the things you would want and the attributes you would want in a king, probably on the outward, they possessed more of them than David. But as the first, the first brother was dismissed, God gives Samuel a reminder that perhaps we need today. That reminder is found in verse 7 of chapter 16, if you want to look there with me. So when Samuel sees Eliab, he sees the oldest, he's thinking, this is the one. But God says no, and then we get to verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. 
People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Can somebody say amen? Amen. The Lord looks at the heart. What a powerful statement God makes to the prophet Samuel. Don't look on the outward. God does not judge people like we do. We have a sense of people's heart. We, we have a sense of what they're thinking, but God knows what's on the inside. God looks at the heart. Makes me wonder when I think about David being chosen. It makes me wonder, God looked past all the externals and chose David because he knew what was on the inside. <coughs> our natural tendency, our natural tendency is to judge a book by its cover. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. How many of y'all saw me this morning and thought I was crazy? Bless your heart. Thank you for that. One, thank you, Tex, for being honest. I mean, uh, person that didn't, I didn't just say their name. We, we tend to do that. We tend to judge a book by its cover. And that's what Samuel did when he got to the house of Jesse, but God doesn't look on the outward. God's, there's nothing against being first in your class. There's nothing at being the fastest or the tallest, the most handsome, the pretty. There's nothing against those things. But they're not qualifiers for God's use. Qualifiers to be used by God is the heart. And I'm thankful today that God looks at the heart. He reminds, he reminds Samuel of this truth. Don't judge a book by its cover. And, and many of us know what it's like to be judged by the outward. Or people think they know us and, and they make a judgment before they get to know us. I'm glad today. I'm glad today God looks at the heart. Throughout Scripture, not, it's not isolated just to the story of David. But all throughout Scripture, God chooses to use those youngest, the, the weakest, the poorest, the, the least educated, the, the marginalized, those that are forgotten, the ones that the cancel culture has canceled. Those are the, one that, the ones that God wants to use for His honor and His glory. Maybe you find yourself in one of those categories. Maybe you feel, uh, you feel cast aside. Maybe you feel as though, <coughs> as though the world has, has overlooked you. That's fine. Because God doesn't look at those outward things. God looks at the heart. He seems to delight in using weak or cast aside or the least. And we find in Scripture that He does this so that when God does something amazing, people aren't looking at the individual and saying, Wow, look what He did. They're saying, No, wow, look what God did through the individual. See, because this life's not about us getting the glory. This life is about God getting the glory. So David was young, but that's not the only thing we see in this passage of Scripture. There's other things we see about David. The second being this truth, David was looked down upon. I hope you know this, but I'm, I've got to ask the question, was David chosen by God? Yes, that's the consensus. David was chosen by God, but it did not stop people from looking down upon him. And sadly... Sadly, the most grief David faces, the most ridicule that David faces, it's from his own family. Those that you would think that would rally to his side are the ones that give David the most flack. And we find that truth back in chapter 17. I want us to look again at verse 28. The eldest brother, 1 Samuel 17 verse 28. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I, I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see the battle. <coughs> Eliab is not glad to see his little brother. Eliab didn't even want David around. And when you, when you think about the circumstances, the verse says that that Eliab burned with anger when he saw his little brother. Maybe he felt threatened by David being there. Maybe it, maybe, it just, maybe it just caught him unaware. But I began to think about Eliab's reaction. Think one chapter earlier, who had been chosen? Who had been anointed the next king of Israel? It was little brother David. 
I wonder if in that moment, if, if, if Eliab's still not, if there's some jealousy brewing in there because God is using little brother and not him because little brother was chosen and not me. I, I wonder if, if little brother is, is angry because there's a whole army there shaking in their sandals and the only one that seems to be showing any fruit of bravery is little brother. Now, we don't know the exact cause of Eliab's response to David, but it's clear to see Eliab, he goes as far as to call, he calls him conceited, he talks about pride, he talks about David, has a, he's, he's got a wicked heart for even being there, nothing could be further from the truth. David is there because Jesse sent him to get a report about his brothers and to come back. So anything, those things that Eliab is saying of David, they're just not true. Eliab casts him aside. Is it his youthfulness? He's looking at him as he's the, the youngest brother. Is it, is it because of his inexperience? Did Eliab really think David had left his duties to come and watch the battle? Man, I want to stand up in David's defense in that moment. Hey, when, when Samuel came to dad's house, who was, out in the, who was out in the field tending the sheep while everybody else was at the banquet, so to speak? David. Let me throw something in there, a little side note. God often uses the least, the youngest, the least educated. But I think one of the things that, that God smiled about, about the attributes of David, David didn't mind to be one that tended the sheep. David didn't mind being one that maybe, maybe what he needed to do was not glorious. Maybe it was behind the scenes. Let me say as pastor of First Baptist Church, I am thankful for the many, many folks behind the scenes. The volunteers, the, the people that their name doesn't make print. They're, they don't stand before the congregation, but they help. And let me say to you, if that's you, keep doing what you do for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. That's why we do it. Not for the pats on the back, not for the attaboys, not for plaques or awards or accolades. We do it for the glory and honor of God. David was looked down upon. Now, here in just a little bit, we have the cake auction. I, I started to throw this out there during the announcement. I thought, no, I'm, I might not need to say that. But here we go. If, if you want to help our youth and you're on a diet, if you purchase something, if you'll leave it in my office on my desk, I will see to it that your dessert gets donated to a ministry that feeds children in ministry. Mine. <laughs> Today's our youth auction. It's an opportunity, our youth dessert auction. It's an opportunity for us to help our kids go to camp. David was here, this youth. David was looked down upon simply because he was young. Because he was young. With this in mind, Scripture speaks and says that just because you're young, it's not a reason for God not to use you. I love what Paul writes. It's, 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 in, your, it's in your bulletin. There's a reference to 1 Timothy 4.12. Paul is writing to a young Timothy, and there he says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Listen to what he says to this young man. He's not writing to an elder in the church. He says, be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. This is the Apostle Paul writing to a young man. I want to challenge our youth and our kiddos today. Stand up for Jesus. Be faithful to the Lord. Don't let anybody say you are too young. I know that often in this world we, we look... We almost look down upon someone when they stand in the gap and they're young. Or they, they stand to do something and they're young. It's, it's like, well, they're young, they're inexperienced. This is, this is the God's honest truth, youth. When I became a pastor, I had zero experience. Here we are some 13, 14 years later, and this is the God's honest truth. It is my heart's desire to retain the knowledge I have some 13 years later. But I want to keep the zeal of year number one. I want to give it, and there I'm, I have limitations now, but I still want to give it my all. 
Young people, Jesus gave His all. And He wants your all in your school, in your community, with your friends. I heard a statistic this past week that broke my heart. In America, only two out of ten children attend church. Only two out of ten. We, we say this often, but it is so true. So many, the only Bible they see is the one that you live before them as God's hands and feet. David was despised because he was young. But that wasn't a factor that God would say, he's young, I can't use him. I love what William Carey said. Youth, expect great things from God. And when you do, attempt great things for God. Being young is not a disqualifier for the use of God. It's actually a qualifier. Paul's encouragement back to Timothy. He says to that young man, be an example to all believers in what you say, the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. I love that regardless of what the naysayers had to say, David was on mission. Can I challenge you today? Isn't it easy to get discouraged? I promise I haven't blown my nose on this yet. Let me use this as an example. What do y'all see? A black, black mark? What else? Is that it? Is that all? Thank you. When we hold up the hanky and we are asked, what do you see? We go to the blot. I see the line. It's actually a D. One of my sweet little ladies crocheted a nice little D on there. But from where you're at, it looks like maybe an ink stain, right? But that's what our eye is drawn to. Why isn't our eye drawn to the, to the other 99% of the handkerchief that has no spot, no blemish? What in the world are you talking about, Pastor Jeff? I'm talking about David was not dismayed by the naysayers. And I know you don't do this, so this is just for Jeff Duval. There can be 99% positive in my life, and one naysayer, and I go home, and i got to stand before the congregation and tell you the truth. I go home, and I'm battling in my mind what the naysayer said. Now, I'm not here to tell you that God's people have a carefree life. God's people still are in the hospital. God's people still face cancer. God's people still have broken arms. But I'm here to tell you that for the child of God, the majority of life is positive. But if we're not careful, the naysayers will, will crop up. And if we're not careful, we will allow the naysayers to get us off track for what God has called us to do. David does not do that. David stays the course. He's put down, yes, but he stays the course. And this gets us to the final point of the sermon. What was David's focus? We find that back in chapter 17 in verse 26, and it's this. David was God-focused. David was God-focused. God back to verse 26. David asked the soldiers standing nearby... What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine? Uh, the King James says this uncircumcised Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God. Did you catch the last thing David spoke? The last thing David asks in the verse who is this pagan Philistine? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway? that he would defy the armies of the living God. Here's why this statement is important. It shows who's David, who, who David's allegiance is to. Notice with me, David does not refer to Goliath as one who defiles or defies the armies of Saul. He does not refer to Goliath as one who defies the armies of Israel. He refers to, to Goliath as one who defies the armies of the living God. Why does he say that? Why is it important? Because it shows us 
David, he asked the question, is there not a cause? David is perturbed in this moment because his God is being defied by Goliath. He's being defied by Goliath. David, but David doesn't, he's not, he's not put off because Saul is perturbed. He's not put off because the Israelite army is perturbed. He is, he's put off because Goliath is defying the one true and living God. Now, just in case you weren't here last week, I'm going to use this and I won't be able to use it as an example anymore. David is standing against a mighty or a large foe. And I, I, like, I like to picture things. I need help with picturing things. Out in our foyer, the ceiling is 10 foot. So if, if Goliath is standing upright and has his helmet on, Goliath's head is just barely missing. When you walk out of this place today, Goliath is standing upright with his helmet on. He's just barely missing the top of that ceiling. A giant man. But out on that battlefield, with a giant foe, there's two things, and we close, there's two things bigger than Goliath. The first, if I ask the question, what's bigger on the battlefield? It's the Sunday school answer. God. Thank you, Sunday school teacher. God's bigger on that battlefield than Goliath ever will be. The second thing, this is what blessed me today. There's another thing on that battlefield that's greater than Goliath. And it's the faith David has in his God. I ask the congregation today, are there Goliaths in your life? Is there something large that you are facing? Let's, let's be honest today, and, and maybe this is for the men. Well, actually, I've known some stubborn women. None of them live at my house. I think about courage. I think about courage. David hadn't dismissed Goliath being huge. He's got eyes. He knows what Goliath is capable of doing. But why this blesses my heart is his faith. His faith knows what his God is capable of doing. Goliath is a great foe. And I, this is one of my questions in heaven I want to ask David David we see what the script we we see your words and we know that you acted in courage but when you stepped on the out on that battlefield was there anything inside of you that said Whew! if it did that's not what he spoke but here's the thing for the congregation 2022 courage is not the absence of fright. Courage is the ability to do what is right, even if there's fear, even if there's fright, even if there is unknowing. So David is not showing any fear. And that's because he has faith in God. Now here's, here's, where, we often, here's where we often make a mistake when we face our Goliaths. We see that great foe we maybe, maybe we look around us and we see others with their great foe and we see them stand in faith and we, we want, I want that faith. I wish I had the faith of David. I, I wish I had the faith of this saint. I wish I had the, the faith of this church member that I know. You know what scripture says about our faith? Victory in our life is not about us. Victory in our life is about God and what He can do. Now I'm not a What's the, the person that studies all things green? I am so glad I'm not the only one that can't remember what that's called. Thank you. I'm not a botanist. I hope that's the right word. Don't Google it. So, yesterday I'm at Walmart and I buy, I love grapes. I love grapes. I really like the seedless grapes. Real quick, how do you have an orchard of seedless grapes? 
You don't have any seeds. Another question for another day. Sorry, I chased a rabbit. <laughs> do y'all know, do y'all know, what's, what's something that you bite into and you got to be careful or the seed will get you? Apple. Watermelon seeds. They used to tell me, you eat them watermelon seeds, the watermelon vine will grow out your ear. You better be careful. So when you, when you get a chance, and, and maybe before this is over, Pastor Jeff will find some. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? I'm going to give them out one Sunday morning at the beginning of service, and then I'm going to have a prize for everybody that doesn't lose it. And you got to keep it in your hand. Those of you that have seen one, if I held it in my hand right now, could you see it from where you see it? J-Rod and LT probably couldn't see it as close as I am to them. Here's what Scripture says. With faith... The size of a grain of mustard seed. You can speak to the mountain and see it cast into the sea. Wow. So I don't have to have a degree in theology. I don't have to be the greatest Christian that ever walked the face of the planet. I just have to have my faith in the God of the universe. Knowing that yes, my, my Goliath may be great. But my God is greater. I want to ask Miss Paula and Anna to come as we close out today. Here, here's the reminder for us. Here's the reminder for us. And this is a, this is a timely truth. I, I remember hearing this when I was a kid. Talking about life and Goliaths or, or storms or things that we face. So I want, to, I want to poll you today. Is it still true that for the child of God... You're either going into a storm in the midst of one or coming out. Is that true? It's true. And, and, and storm, you, you can replace that with, with battle or, or test or trial, whatever, however you want to do it. I'm here to tell you today, God's people still go through stuff. God's people still go through stuff. We still face trials. We face battles. So you're either going into one, you're in one, or you're coming out. So how, how can we live victoriously regardless if we're going into it, we're in that storm, we're in that battle, or we're coming out? I love John 15, 5. Jesus gives the, the key to victory. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So for the Jeff Duvalls in the congregation, what's the opposite of not being able to do anything? Martha McCall, your voice stood out. Say it again. I have seen some amazing, amazing testimonies to that truth right here in this room people that faced cancer death of children death of loved ones loss of jobs financial struggles and yet not because of the branch they were victorious but because of the vine they were victorious today maybe you face a Goliath I gotta ask you with heads bowed and eyes closed are you feeling defeated is fear presiding or is faith I ask you today to be honest in this moment pastor myself our family, we're facing, I'm facing a Goliath. That's me. God bless those hands. If that's you, I'm just asking for prayer today, that's me, Pastor. That's me. God bless those hands. Hands down. Seniors, 
middle age, and some of our young people. Hands went up all over this place. If you're a child of God, I close today reminding you, it's not that you're going to make it because you're all that. It's because of who you're attached to, the vine. When you're attached to the vine that is Jesus Christ, when the, when the rain stops, you still receive nourishment because of who you're attached to. When the victory seems impossible, you receive victory because of who you're attached to. So today, if those hands that were lifted represent a Goliath, I want to challenge you today. Press into Jesus. Here in just a moment, when the opportunity arises, maybe even now, come to this altar and, and lay that Goliath at the altar and say, Lord Jesus, I give it to you today. I'm victorious, not because of me, but because of you. God wants you to have that victory. He wants you to walk in that today. I want to ask you today, maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know about God, you know about Jesus, but your honest confession, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Would there be one in this moment that would, by an uplifted hand, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. When you pray today, remember me. I don't know Jesus Christ. I know about Him, but I don't know Him as my Lord and my Savior. That's me. I want you to raise your heads, and I want you to stand to your feet. I want to give you this challenge. An altar call will begin. Hands went up all over this room. God knows the need. You have an opportunity today to come and to pray. Many hands did not go up. And for those, this is my request of you. We've got families with loved ones in the hospital that are awaiting procedures next week. We have families with loved ones who are in uh, assisted living scenarios because of injury that need our prayers. Ms. Frances Lee needs our prayers. Gay and Jean that are tending to her, they need our prayers. But if you have a co-worker or a friend, someone that is facing a Goliath, let's do something today. Maybe all is well for you and your household. Let's do something today, FBC family. Let's bend the knee for those in need. If, if, if all is well, God presses upon your heart someone who is facing a Goliath. I'm going to ask you to come today and bend the knee and say, God, I, I pray today for my brother, for my sister, for my child, whoever it is. And if you raise the hand that you have a need, I'm going to be over on this side. And if you need me for prayer, I'd love the opportunity to pray with you. Lord Jesus, give liberty in this moment. You know the needs that are represented here, the needs that are beyond this room, you know them. God, give liberty in this moment, and I pray this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you will, you come. Speak.